Hey, are you ready for this? I am ready for a wild ride. Do you think they're ready for the wild ride? I hope so. I Man, hope so. so we just got done photographing two different models, two performers, dancers. Totally different genres, right? In one day. One day. Check it out. It is time for another road trip with the Chopstick guys. Chopstick guys. I'm looking forward to this trip. You know, this was kind of a, a quick trip. Actually, we, we only decided to do this a week ago. Yeah. You called me up and said, hey, I got this idea. We have been totally, what's the word? Infatuated, Infamed, fascinated. Fascinated. With Jordan Matter and his... Uh, and many of you might say, what's the matter? We'll tell you about <laughs> it. <laughs> you need to look up Jordan Matter's we got to put a link down below to his Appreciate channel because it's that good. It will inspire you. We love taking pictures of ballerinas. Yeah, if you've been around us or, or uh, you know, been on some of our workshops, we always we always try to have a ballerina. In fact, Joe McNally always said, have a ballerina in That's your pocket. Right. You always have great, great pictures. Exactly. Hello. Can you hear me? So we are heading to Los Angeles. Yep. If you are familiar with California, where we live, it's a about a six hour drive down to, to uh, Los Angeles, but we're gonna photograph two dancers this week. So we have one of our old friends in the morning, yep. who is more of a modern hip hop dancer. So we're gonna do some real urban -y stuff. And then in the afternoon, who do we have? In the afternoon, we have Bethany Hope, and she is uh, a ballerina, a singer, kind of a... Yes, she's going to a conservatory in Los Hollywood. Angeles, right? In, yeah, right right next to the Capitol Records building. Yeah. So it's a big place, kind of a conglomerate of people that are uh, uber-talented, and yes. they get to learn even more uber-talented. Think about like what what's your favorite portrait you've ever taken? It's is it something you took with your brand new 810? No. Or is it something you took five, six? My favorite portrait still to this day is something that I took like eight and a half years ago on a D three hundred with a it wasn't I don't even believe it was a two point eight lens, you know, it was like some variable Nikon twenty four to one twenty it was like a 3.5 to 5.6 lens. Yep. It, but it's still my favorite portrait. And I, it, today, I don't know that new equipment would make it any better. It just, everything came together at the right point. And it might not even make it better because you're going to be thinking about that equipment more than just thinking about the picture. You know, I think when you said that, thinking back to, like, some of my favorite pictures, even some of my favorite pictures of my kids. Yeah. They were not taken with my new, shiny, fancy equipment. They were taken with much more basic cameras. But you know, I love the pictures because I love what's in the picture. Yep. Yeah, that makes a difference too. You know, totally. It, just, yep. it brings back memories, and that's real. That really is when you when you get down to the purpose of taking pictures, it's building memories. Yep. Even if you're just somebody saying, "Please take my picture," they're saying, "Please record this moment in time exactly. of where I'm at in life." And once once you become the photographer, you forget that. You think that each picture has to be technically perfect, yeah. zero noise, exposed throughout the whole image perfectly, lit in seven different directions. Totally. But yep. you know what? When your favorite pictures, you don't care because it's the content to build those memories. Yeah. Like we kind of got off on a little rabbit trail there, but but I think it's actually really... No, it's funny because immediately when you said that, I was thinking in that same book I'm referencing about Chris Orwig, he's got a whole chapter that's just on blurry photos. And it's the idea that everything doesn't have to be sharp and sometimes it actually enhances the story to have things out of focus you know things don't have to be perfect it's it is about how does that speak to you yeah that's a good point yep so it also you know again i feel like i'm in like oprah's book club now. i was gonna say camera lucida that book i think i've talked to you about it before is it was you know a book written in French and it's been translated into English and you can find it on Amazon once in a while. In Somebody English. 
in English, yeah. You can read in French if you want. But this guy basically went out, he was a professor, and he wasn't even a photographer. And he was like, I want to do this study and figure out what makes a good photograph good and why. Because he was saying, you know, I realized that there was like pictures that I would look at that people were telling me are great. But he's like, I, I could have cared less about them. Yeah. But there's other ones that I go, I feel emotionally attached. That's and like, the key is the emotion. And so he came up with this whole big theory that he calls the stadium and the punctum. And he's like, every picture has a stadium, which is the some word. The, now I can't say it now. You, The punctum, something like that. The punctum <laughs> and the stadium. Okay. And so like they said, the stadium's more of this thing of like, oh, it's by the beach and everybody loves to see the ocean. And that makes it a good photo. But he's like, then there's the stadium, which is, or the punctum which is like an element somewhere in that that speaks to someone's emotional side. Like He's like, it, it could be a bottle of suntan lotion. That's a brand that you used to use as a kid that's sitting in the picture somewhere. I, I do get emotional over that. That brings you back to a time, yeah. <laughs> but it takes, them, takes you like, back to the beach house you used to go as a kid. It's like every, every image to make it great has to have those two things, a stadium and a punk. Well, room. think about that. Think of the iconic images that you've seen in National Geographic, right? National Geographic photographers put out some of the best work exactly, in the world. Yep. I mean, there's just no doubt about it. Yeah. But you can look through a National Geographic magazine, and there's always the image that you go, wow. Not because it was exposed perfectly or the colors are super saturated. But there was that extra little element yeah, that there made was you something go, in there that you're wow, like, I feel that picture. Yeah. Interesting. Yep. So it just, I get it. It's always one of those things of like says, you know, get better at your craft. Those are the, the it's always those little things. Yep. Elements that tell a story. We make jokes about people who always tell us pictures need to tell a story. That they're right. They do. If they don't tell you anything other than it's just a neat picture, it's just a neat picture. Yeah. Thanks, Sarah Dawson. Because <laughs> you taught us in India. That's right. That, always tell a story. And it is funny. She has ruined a lot of photos for she me. She has. That's Sarah Dawson again. I'll take a so picture much. and I'll just go, eh. It, it's just a picture of a person. No, we, we joke around. You know, it's about Sarah. She it, follow Sarah Dawson on Instagram. Yes. She's a great photographer, a friend of ours. And, you know, she, she did. That was one thing. We, we went on this trip to India and, and she told us about just... You know, tell, a, tell story, a story, tell a, tell a story. story. And we were we love making fun of her because she's just a fun person to hang out with. But it was like, we actually, <laughs> we, we took it to heart. And it, now it, every time we take yeah, a picture. Like two weeks in with that trip with her, we were like, man, she's right. My pictures <laughs> just really aren't telling a story. And every time I fire it now, I hear her voice going, I don't know, that's just a picture of somebody. Yep. So... I'm always looking to try to push it a little further, so it has made me a better photographer. I, th I think it has. Yep. You know what's weird? The other day I was thinking that I'm a child of the 60s and we're about to go into the 20s. Yeah. Do you remember when you're thinking, Oh, wow, back in the roaring 20s. And just think, those people were born during the Civil War. Yeah. But now, we're like the Civil War people, too, are my kids. That's right. <laughs> and just think of their kids. Wow, your grandpa was born in the 1960s? <laughs> <laughs> That's craziness. He was a young adult in the 80s. The 80s, those were quite a time. They were. High school years. Flash dance. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know I have never... Yeah, I have watched Flashdance. There's a lot of movies from the 80s. I, I'm a huge movie buff, but the ones I just refuse to watch. I have never seen Dirty Dancing. And I've never seen Footloose. Oh, Footloose is good. I mean, no, you would like it. I know you struggle with hip-hop dancers. <laughs> yeah. These are Footloose. I think you would like it. And I like Kevin Bacon. Well, everybody loves Bacon. And I love Bacon. Just <laughs> Bacon in general. Yeah, I just, I don't know. And it's just probably because they're dance movies. I just never... You've got to think against dance movies. I do. you got to start getting into your inner dance self. You're going to be 
you taking dance pictures. Exactly. You gotta, you gotta so I'm gonna have to learn. So I'm gonna have to watch. So the, what you're gonna have to do, you go home on Netflix and watch Stepsisters. Go, <laughs> go home. Put on your leggings, your pink leggings. That's right. My leg warmers. Put on your little shirt that Let's you know. Get one, physical, one physical. side just kind of falls off the shoulder, and you just watch those movies. Yeah. Little headband, so your hair doesn't get in your way. Uh -huh. Maybe just a beard band. <laughs> a chin band. All neon. Yes. And just like have a big, I'll binge watch all the 80s dance movies. So you know when they have the dances at, at my daughter's high school and they have like the 80s neon dance? Yeah. Was it really that neon in the 80s? No. No, I don't. I, well, maybe it was. Because I wore a lot of pink and like that I, color in the so 80s. I was a preppy in the yeah, 80s. Yeah, I was too. And I wore pink Argyle sweaters. And yeah, but they weren't the neon. They, they were bright. just, you had to have the... You know, eyes odd, pink eyes odd. And yeah, yeah. Had everybody had to have a pink Brooks Brothers button down. And then you put your little sweater over your shoulder yeah, and tie it up. Our girl sweater. Yeah. And you know, I wore top siders. I still wear them to this day. You know what? I did up until a few years ago. Why don't you wear them anymore? I don't know. I love top siders. I do too. I think they're wonderful. They're the best shoe ever. One of my favorite photographs is a photograph of me in Mexico. Your top siders? No. Oh, okay. But right, <laughs> well, that's nice. I'm glad that's their favorite. It's me eating, sitting on the hood of my friend's car that we drove to Mexico, and his car was parked in a creek because we took our washing pans and we washed his car that day. And off on the side of the bank are my top siders sitting, and we drove away, and that's where they were. Hey, that's why I love that photo because I can <laughs> memorialize my right, last top pair of top siders. So when you wore your top siders, let me ask you this question in the '80s: Did you peg your pants? Occasionally. Yes, I always peg my did pants. You? I did. I didn't all the time, but occasionally. I well, you were more bohemian, probably. Were you, uh, were you true preppy? Yeah. Okay, because I was a real preppy. Oh, yeah. Like preppy preppy. Yeah, like you had to have the Norwegian check sweater from L.L. Bean. There you go. I actually had the preppy handbook. <laughs> and you read it? And read it. Lived it. I wore Eau Sauvage. <laughs> I still wear Eau Sauvage once in a while. From Christian Dior. Christian Dior. That was the... That's a nice preppy. Do you ever read a separate piece? A separate piece of what? Just a separate the book. A separate no, piece. No, oh, so you're not real preppy then. Sorry. You gotta read a separate piece. I still do. About that boarding school. I think it was much better than Catcher in a Rye in the Rye. Well, I'm not a big fan of rye bread. Are you a fan no. of rye bread? I you know what? I do I, I if it's on a good Reuben, but apart from what about that, a bad Reuben? And I, I knew a couple bread. Rubens that weren't so good. But no, you know, I just don't like rye bread. Like when you go to the stage deli or, you know, those big delis in New York, they serve this incredible pastrami. Like it's this tall, right? It's this tall. But it's on rye, steak and rye bread, and it ruins that whole taste, I think. It's just oh. like that rye. Right. See, and I don't mind it on there. Because you got to kind of get those soury tastes That's together. Right. Sourdough works wonderfully well. It does. But rye just has that little seed. <laughs> but you like bird seed bread. I do. See, I that is not certain the bread kinds of bread. You know what I'm chicken fried. You cold beer on a Friday night. A pair of jeans that fit just right. In the radio up. And is Chia actual like Chia pet? When people are eating chia these days. Yes, yeah, chia it's, seeds. It's, it's chia seeds. It's the same thing you make the little chia man, the chia yeah, pet, the that's chia weird. chia dog, chia whatever. I had it. Did you ever have a chia? And what's quinoa or coin? Quinoa. Quinoa. Quinoa is like a rice. But it's, it's like not rice. rice. No, it's quinoa. I know, but it's it's <laughs> like a rice, but, but it's, it's not, not rice. It's quinoa. And I've had it. I just I just don't. It's kind of like risotto. So risotto, the only reason why people are eating risotto today is because, is of, because of Gordon, Gordon Ramsay, Ramsay and Hell's exactly. Kitchen. Because what did he always say in Hell's Kitchen? Where's the risotto? Yeah. You have five minutes for risotto. You burnt the risotto. Right? The risotto, risotto. Sorry. I didn't even know what it was. But no, nobody, nobody in America did. knew what it was until Gordon Ramsay popped over yeah. the pond with his risotto. Yeah. And then you feel like an idiot going like, I don't know what risotto is. <laughs> but we're going to talk about like it. Like quinoa. I don't know what that is. I just know it's like okay. round quinoa. stuff. Okay, quinoa. My wife has tried to serve quinoa before, and you know what? I know I serve quinoa salad. No, like, just give me some rice or something. Put bacon on it. Here's the, here's the thing I want to say is kale. 
I don't understand the whole kill. Uh -uh. Super food. So Chick-fil-A has a kale salad that my daughter, who you know worked for Chick-fil-A for years, was in love with. Now here's the silly thing. One day she said, hey dad, can you bring home, she wasn't working that day, I really want something from Chick-fil-A. I'm like, sweet, I can go get myself a chicken sandwich. You know what she wanted? The kale, kale salad. salad. Now get this, the kale salad, I said, I'll take the regular <laughs> size kale salad. They're fantastic, $7.95. Like, okay, which is expensive. Yeah. But Chick-fil-A is expensive. High quality, fantastic service, but one of the pricier fast, fast food. food. Yep. So, they give me, here's your salad, sir, in the bag, right? Is there anything in there? I look down, it's a three by three square plastic thing. No $7.95. Like, it's kale. It's kale. It's not just kale. It's kale superfood. <laughs> well, it better be superfood for $7.95 for an ounce of lettuce. Yep. And it's awful. Have you had it? I have had kale salad, you like and it? I do not like okay. it. It's that tart, sour, it's a weird sour, like earwax sour. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you feel like Shrek, the earwax, but yeah. it, it's just not... It, by the way, have you eaten earwax? Is that how you know it's so sour? I think everybody as a kid has tasted it at some point, <laughs> and it just sticks with you. But, no, I don't understand the superfood kale craze. No. Just like, uh, what was the craze in the 90s was... Come on, you'd go to Jamba Juice and they go, would you like a such and such it's grass like the, shooter? Yeah, like grass shooter. Here. No, I just mowed my lawn. And that's exactly what it tastes and like. And I used my power mower <laughs> without the bag on it, so I was catching enough grass in my teeth. That's exactly what it is. They take the grass. Because we know, you know, <laughs> so on, owners of some, some Jamba Juices, right? And that's all they do. They mow the little lawn that they have exactly. there. Yep. Flip, flip, flip. And they put it in the bowl. <laughs> Make your, your juice. So one of the big things was... When I stayed, I was in Mexico for six months, and uh, these little kids in this pueblo we were living in, they were like, have you ever had alfalfa juice? Or like, uh, they're like, it's the greatest ever. The alfalfa's ready, we're gonna make some. It's like, oh, this is gonna be exciting. So they got all this alfalfa cuttings that they brought in, and it's like, this is gonna be so cool. And they like crushed it all by hand. And I think one of somebody in their neighborhood had a blender and they threw it in the blender and they kind of strained it through a piece of cloth. And you could smell it. You're just like, yep, smells like an alfalfa field. And they're like, oh, it's the greatest juice possible. <laughs> so they make like this gallon of alfalfa juice. And you're thinking. Which they cut down three acres of alfalfa. Exactly to make. <laughs> yeah. But it was like, okay. And they're like, no, it's not done yet. And then they go and they put like six cups of sugar in the thing. It's like, there, now it's ready. And it tasted like a shooter, but it was so sweet. It's like being a kid with Kool-Aid, you know? It's like... But did you get the alfalfa smile like the Kool-Aid smile? Oh, you did. It, it just tasted like a fresh summer day. But all you tasted was sugar. Yeah, that's it. Just like Kool-Aid as a kid. You know, you got the packet like this little tiny, it's like a teaspoon of powder. And it's like, okay, 14 cups of sugar. <laughs> <laughs> so what was the thing when we were a kid? It was like the dip the lip or something. Remember that? It came with this white edible they dipper. It and yeah. stuck it and in they there. And they just stuck it in. They still have those. They? But I mean, what kind of value is that thing? You like, here, dip this stick into sugar and just lick yeah. it. I want to know when kids made the transition from sour and from not sour and hot to sour and hot. Like my kids love super sour and like super hot foods. Like. They, they won't eat like a spicy, you know, burrito or something, but Takis, Flaming Hot Cheetos, they love those things. As I was a kid, I would have avoided those things like the plague. I still kind like, of avoid oh, them. I don't want to burn my mouth. And then sour? Why would I torture myself? Because that's all of, the whole fun is looking at your friends going, mm. One of the worst candies ever invented. Sour Patch? No. Lemon Drops. Lemon drops. I actually kind of like Lemon do Drops. Do you really? I do because... I like my mom would always have them in her purse. It's the reward at the end. You know, you're, you're like, get that super pucker power going back here. And, yeah. then, oh. and then it's like, oh, no, now it's sweet and enjoyable. In fact, maybe we should go out and buy some lemon drops if this guy stops putting out his brakes. I felt like I was going to smash into him. Yeah, there's cars in front of him. That's what's happening. But when you're only going 93 on Highway 5, it just doesn't seem fast enough, <laughs> does it? <laughs> How come they're going so much faster than us? In the slow lane. Yeah. You know why? I'll tell you why. Do you see what's in front of us? Yeah, a Prius. A Prius. 
Yeah. Now, the Prius is the new old man with a hat. It is. Used to be, if you were behind an old man in a hat, you're going slow. Now it's like, a uh, Prius. And I don't mean to make fun of the people that own Priuses. I'm very glad you own your Prius, and I'm glad you're happy. <coughs> My brother, Mark, you know, owns a Prius. But the thing is... No wonder he goes to cemeteries. <laughs> the thing is...